hello, everyone. Uh, we'll just get started with the introduction while people are still uh, joining the webinar. But welcome to Manitoba Important Bird Area Spring Webinar Series on Bird Identification. My name is Amanda Shape, and I am the coordinator for the Manitoba Important Bird Area Program. In years past, Nature Manitoba and Manitoba IBA have held workshops for a variety of types of bird identification. Unfortunately, they had to be canceled this year with COVID-19, but we'd like to welcome you to our spring series, uh, spring webinar series. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping comments. This webinar will be recorded and posted on YouTube for future viewing. Um, we ask that everyone in the webinar today keep their microphones um, muted during the presentation. Um, if you have questions you want to ask during the presentations, please type them into the chat box, which is um, if you press the little bubble symbol on the top right hand corner of your screen, you can get to the chat box. Um, we'll answer questions at the end of the talk and it looks like there won't be too many people on the webinar today, so we'll likely be able to open it up for um, uh, uh, speaking comments, I guess, as opposed to just typing in the chat. Um, questions are being recorded, so if we don't get to all of your questions during our time today, we can respond to them via email, or if there's something we're not sure about, we need to get back to you, we can respond via email. Um, so today, myself and Rebecca from the Nature Conservancy of Canada um, will be talking about uh, grasslands and grassland bird identification. Um, so a little bit of background on myself. I've been the moderator in some of these webinars, but so far have not presented. Uh, I've left that to our guest presenters. Um, but I became interested in birding when I worked at Delta Marsh as a field technician for two season, seasons. I wasn't there for the birds. I was there for the fish and water quality sampling. Um, but it was the birds that really caught my eye living in the middle of a marsh. Um, and once I finished my undergraduate degree, I started on my Master of Science at the University of Manitoba, where I studied the impact of climate change on spring migration and nesting of a bird called the Purple Martin, working with citizen scientists to collect data within Manitoba and across North America. And during that time, I was also volunteering as a leader at our a local nature center's birding program, as well as volunteering uh, with the Manitoba Important Bird Area Program on bird blitzes. And then a little bit of background on Rebecca. You can see her presentation is up and ready to go. She is the acting science manager for the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Manitoba region. She graduated from Brandon University with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and a major in Botany and immediately began working at the NCC as a conservation intern in 2011. She has past experience conducting field research in Churchill and worked as a as research assistant at Brandon University. Rebecca is involved in various conservation planning and science activities in Southern Manitoba, including the development of natural area conservation plans and property management plans, implementing effectiveness monitoring programs and managing natural area based science initiatives. So a big thank you to Rebecca for starting us off this afternoon and uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me today and a chance to talk a little bit about um, our amazing Manitoba prairies and some of the work that uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada uh, does here in Manitoba. So I'm just going to jump in with a little uh, overview about uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada and uh, briefly talk about uh, some of our grassland work. So the Nature, Nature Conservancy of Canada is uh, a nonprofit land conservation organization. We work across Canada to protect um, some of the best remaining natural spaces in our country, um, as well as connect uh, Canadians to our natural history and, and inspire the current and future, um, future generations um, in doing so as well. Um, so our mission is to you know, conserve these important natural areas and their biological diversity um, you know, across Canada if, as a legacy for future generations. Um, so our vision, we, our vision is that uh, we hope to see in the future a world where Canadians conserve nature in all of its diversity and that uh, the lands are safeguarded the lands and water um, of Canada are, are safeguarded um, in perpetuity you know, to sustain life. 
So NCC is a science and evidence-based organization, and we use a variety of different tools to achieve uh, conservation success and you protect and enhance biodiversity across the country. Uh, we're always seeking uh, innovations and to improve our work through learning and sharing. Um, and generally our work is broken down into kind of four broad uh, strategies. So we use science and research um, to ensure that we're using the best available information to guide our work um, and ensure that we're investing our conservation dollars effectively and efficiently. Uh, we use securement to directly protect um, lands through whether it's purchase, donation, or conservation agreements. So protect some of these most important, most vulnerable landscapes. We steward those lands and ensure that they're managed uh, sustainably into the future. And we engage uh, with people and communities um, to connect them back to their natural heritage and um, provide opportunities for people to get out and, and see and walk on these amazing spaces. Oops. So over the last um, more than 50 years, uh, across Canada, we've conserved um, or, or helped, helped to protect and conserve over 14 million hectares. Um, and uh, this includes, you know, over 1,100 properties across the country that, that are owned and managed by Nature Conservancy Canada. Um, this is, um, our success is, uh, and thanks to, uh, is, is due to our amazing donors, um, partners, other organizations, as well as partnerships with governments and, and grants that we, we, we receive. So it's a large part um, as a result of our the amazing donors who support us and our volunteers across the country who were able to have this amazing success. Uh, in Manitoba, specifically, we've conserved over uh, 70,000 hectares. Um, this is across over uh, 200 uh, securement projects, as well as other types of programming where we've supported or provided um, help um, to, to conserve other lands, not necessarily just the ones that we've secured ourselves. So currently, NCC focuses our work in programming in uh, what we call nine priority natural areas across uh, southern Manitoba. Um, so these represent some of the most intact and natural landscapes that remain um, in the southern part of our province. Um, so these areas are intended to help us focus and guide uh, the work and programs we do and ensure that we're being as effective as possible um, as we implement this work. Uh, these areas support nationally and provincially uh, important ecosystems and species and um, focus on connectivity and building uh, resilience um, into the future. Within each of these areas, we develop natural area conservation plans um, that examine the most at-risk species and ecosystems and the threats to them and set up strategies to ensure our long-term conservation uh, success. So one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, one of the ecosystems that we focus on here in Manitoba are um, uh, grasslands. Uh, so generally speaking, there's four kind of broad types of prairies uh, across Manitoba. Um, this includes the mixed grass prairie, which are associated with um, largely the, the Aspen kind of parkland ecoregions, more in central and, and western Manitoba. There's fescue prairies, so these are um, dominated by, by fescue grass and largely associated with what we call kind of the western uplands um, and kind of the boreal uh, transitional ecozones, ecoregions um, on the western part of the province. We've got the tall grass prairie, um, the northern, um, most northern extent tall grass prairie. Uh, occurs uh, up in the interlake in Manitoba and extends down the interlake plains towards the border. And uh, there's also sandhill prairies, and these are really unique uh, prairies associated with sandy soils in uh, Aeolian complexes, which are wind-worked areas often uh, shaped into dunes. It's a very unique uh, community that are kind of scattered across the western part of the province. Um, there's also other communities associated with these grasslands, such as our savannas, where you have um, a very low cover of, of trees. Um, these are actually quite rare and globally, um, Oak Baroque savannas in particular are actually kind of rare at a global scale. Um, we do have them in Manitoba. And there's something called Alvar grasslands, which are actually further north of the interlake. And these are associated with um, shallow soils over kind of limestone and dolomite 
um, bedrock and create kind of a unique community. And while not prairies per se, um, they do uh, form a, a grassland kind of community. So why do we uh, focus our work on, on these amongst other communities? So grasslands are among uh, the least protected, most threatened of the world's terrestrial habitats. And they continue to disappear um, at an alarming rate. Um, there is some variation disagreement in, in estimates, but there's some estimates that indicate that up to 90% of Manitoba's native prairie may have been lost. So in addition to providing critically important wildlife habitat, prairie and grasslands also buffer our waterways. Uh, they filter our water, sequester carbon, provide habitat for pollinators, and are the foundation of sustainable ranching economies in our rural communities. So what do we actually do here in Manitoba? So one of our uh, tools in our toolbox is, um, as I mentioned before, securement. So conserving the last and best remaining blocks of native prairie in our province. So this can inc include securement, whether it's through uh, conservation agreements, fee simple purchase or donation, um, but it can also include building strategic partnerships with other organizations, uh, government partners, uh, local communities, and landowners to help implement conservation action at a landscape scale so we recognize that uh, you know direct protection and through securement is not feasible and not actually the best way to achieve this at a scale that's going to be most effective and and give the best uh, results for biodiversity across the province so it's really developing and working with partners um, across the landscape so restoration and stewardship so the, those lands once they are you know conserved and protected they still need to ensure that they have appropriate management to ensure that they are um, um, going to continue to be viable and, and, and have good biodiversity into the future. So this includes uh, restoration of prairie ecosystems through active restoration using locally appropriate genetic materials, so actively restoring prairie in, in areas where it had been lost, um, restoring uh, ecological function of degraded grasslands through rooted species or forest encroachment control, such as fire uh, or mechanical control. Um, we actively control invasive species on these lands, which are degrading some of these um, prairie areas, and um, as well as partnering with agricultural producers on compatible management activities, such as grazing or haying. So these are just a few of the many things we do to maintain these grasslands, um, both on the, the lands that we own and have helped protect, as well as working with other landowners to, across the um, province. So research is another big, um, part of our work. So as we said, we are a science and evidence-based organization. So having the best available knowledge is key to ensuring the work we're doing is actually effective and that we understand um, everything we need to, to make the best decisions. Um, and there's a there's simply amazing amount of things we just don't even know yet um, about new species that are still being found. Um, uh, there's a lot of species of risk that we don't necessarily even understand enough of their biology or ecology to, to know what the best, what, what they need or how best to ensure these lands are protected or how to manage them. Um, and we do direct species of risk recovery work for the species of risk that occur on our lands or on lands that we've partnered with others to help. Um, so a big part of our work. So some of the species shown here on the top right is actually the Powashik skipperling, which is a great example of, we knew so little about the species and it was declining rapidly, it still is. And uh, an amazing amount of research was required to, for us to even understand how what we needed to do and why, why they were disappearing. And it's been a massive collaboration, international and Canadian partners. And it's a perfect example of, of coming together and those incredible partnerships are needed to, to help ensure that we're covering these species. And engagement and volunteer opportunities. So as I mentioned before, inspiring and connecting people back to these amazing spaces is incredibly important. Um, so we do this through uh, various engagement activities um, with local communities and youth. So we have volunteer events and opportunities for people, um, different types of uh, events just to get people out, uh, educational opportunities, working with school groups, for example, um, and providing access to land so people can get out and appreciate and learn and, and see. Um, See these areas. So if you're at all interested in learning a bit more about um, what we're doing and some of these areas and different types of prairies, um, you can visit our website, natureconservancy.ca. There's also some information about some of our sites that currently are 
have you know are publicly available through our nature destinations website. Um, so we're actively working to make more lands, um, more opportunities in the future. And those sites that so far are are open are are actually on that website. And um, while things have been a little slow this year and there's some limitations, as we know, um, we do uh, typically offer volunteer events and opportunities for people to come out and help us um, hands-on work on on in the work we're doing through our conservation volunteer events. And there's a website, so um, more into the future, there would be opportunities there if people are interested in, in getting out and uh, taking part. So thank you so much for letting me talk a little bit and um, happy to answer any questions. Um, hi, it's Joe Swartz here. Just a quick question, Rebecca. Are all the um, NCC properties accessible to anybody who wants to go on them? Yeah, so um, many of our properties do have active management. So they might have uh, categories, for example, or some of those other activities. So most of them we do um, uh, ask people to contact us and get permission. That way we can ensure that if there's anything going on, we can let them know. Um, generally speaking, most are open for, um, yeah, for tracking, hiking, um, nature, bird watching, whatever. Um, so in terms of simply being able to go out there, just, just the ones on that one website have kind of open access and there's directions information on that website. But for the rest of them, if uh, um, people are interested in going, we have signs on our properties with phone numbers and you simply just got to give us a call and, and uh, let us know ahead of time. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, if there's no one else, just uh, bear with us for a minute and we'll uh, switch over to the Manitoba IBA presentation. Thank you, Rebecca, very much for uh, telling us more about uh, NCC and the work they do in the grasslands of Manitoba. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll go into a little bit more about grasslands and then go into grassland bird identification in southwestern Manitoba. So types of grasslands, I'm going a little bit broader than um, Rebecca did uh, in her presentation and looking at the sort of western Great Plains. Um, so broadly, we've got three types of grasslands. You've got the tall grass prairie, which is characterized by high annual rainfall and cooler temperatures. And this in Manitoba is found um, south of Winnipeg, down by Gardenton and Vita. And I believe some of that is NCC property. Um, and this map is showing the historical extent of the types of grasslands in the Great Plains, um, with the extent of the tall grass prairie being shown in yellow. Um, and with background in what's left in Manitoba, we know that we don't have all of that area left as tall grass prairie. Um, in fact, less than 1% remains in Manitoba. There's also the short grass prairie whose um, historical extent is shown in green. And they have low annual rainfall and warmer temperatures. And this has never occurred in Manitoba. It, uh, it occurs in the mid to southern central United States and down a little bit into Mexico. Um, what we are primarily focused on today is the mixed grass prairie, which is characterized by medium annual rainfall and moderate temperatures. And this is shown in the large, or the historical extent is shown in the large area in um, the sort of grayish brown color. Um, so less than 10% of the mixed grass prairie remains in Manitoba, and it is primarily right in the very southwest corner of Manitoba, um, where we still have this native prairie. So grasslands were historically maintained through um, grazing pattern, primarily through, um, through large ungulates like um, bison and also fire cycles. Um, both bison grazing and fire cycles prevent encroachment by woody plants that would otherwise change the habitat away from prairie. So for example, encroachment by aspen may start to alter a habitat into more of an aspen woodlands as opposed to a mixed grass prairie if left unchecked. So bison provided, in addition to their grazing, they also provided large and concentrated inputs of nutrients through their poop um, which led to a mosaic pattern of habitats across the landscape. And these areas of taller grass and shorter grass and nutrient-rich and nutrient-poor um, all 
help create a bunch of different habitats and niches uh, for different species to use. Uh, with the arrival of Europeans in North America, um, lar the large herds of bison were unfortunately decimated. Um, fire cycles were suppressed. We have created uh, linear disturbances across the landscape, such as um, roads, transmission line corridors, fences, windbreaks, um, that kind of thing, which breaks up these continuous pieces of habitat that some of these grassland species need. Um, and then also some areas we've turned into agriculture areas uh, through cropping. So the majority of mixed grass prairie in Manitoba occurs on private land, um, which is primarily used by um, cattle producers. And as I said before, without a large herbivore species, prairie sites become so overgrown with trees and shrubs that the habitat sometimes becomes unsuitable for the prairie species uh, who use it to begin with. So working with cattle farmers, um, we can help stop native grasslands from becoming croplands. Um, and also responsible grazing can create that mosaic of habitat that's important for breeding birds um, with cattle fulfilling um, the same functional um, I guess niche that that bison provided the prairie. So Manitoba IBA works with programs um, and and cattle producers uh, like NCC um, in southwestern Manitoba to improve and maintain grasslands in a way that's beneficial both to producers and to the birds. So instead of breaking um, up the bird identification taxonomically. Um, I've gone about it more in terms of um, how the grassland species use the habitat. So first we're going to look at our couple of prairie endemic species um, that have a very strong affinity to or are only found on um, the western Great Plains and specifically our mixed grass prairie here in Manitoba. So the first is the chestnut colored longspur. Um, so for this bird, the male is actually um, quite distinct. He has a rufous or reddish nape, the back of the neck, a creamy neck on the front side, and a black belly, which unfortunately you cannot see in this picture. Um, the female looks sort of more sparrow-like um, with her broad pale eyebrow over top of the eye, a plain face, an un mostly unstreaked breast, and a white belly. Um, so these, this species prefers uh, well grazed pastures and short dry grasslands. Um, so you're going to find them where the grass is, um, is, is shorter. Um, long areas with long grass uh, is not the preferred habitat of the chestnut colored longspur. Um, and with the chestnut colored longspur, like a lot of these prairie species, um, one of the best ways to find them is to first listen for the song or the call. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that today, um, but there are a number of websites um, that you can use um, to, to learn or brush up on your bird calls. So next we have the Baird Sparrow, um, a little bit smaller than the chestnut colored longspur. Overall has a very streaked appearance. Um, it has a narrow breast band of more concentrated uh, streaking and overall a buffy colored head and nape. It also has a weak eye line that extends from the back of the eye, um, which is strongest and most visible near the nape, the back of the neck, and also looks like it has sort of two tops attached to it. Uh, the Baird Sparrow, somewhat opposite to the chestnut colored longspur, prefers ungrazed to moderately grazed tracts of native prairie. Um, or you can find them in areas that are, are grazed short or well-grazed areas um, in the pockets where there's uh, a denser vegetation area. So next we have the Sprague's Pippet. Um, this is a bird that looks also looks sort of sparrow-like. Um, in terms of overall being brown and a little bit stripy. Um, but a couple ways that really stand out for me and tell me this is not a sparrow are the long legs, the longer uh, beak, and the big black eye. So overall, a pale face with that large black eye. It's streaky overall, like a lot of our sparrows. 
um, and it has a necklace of streaks on the breast. When it's in flight, it has extensive white sides on the tail that unfortunately you can't see either very well or at all when it's um, sitting in place. As I said, it's got a strong, a longer, narrower beak than sparrow species. And the Sprague's pipit likes open, expansive um, habitat. It can be areas of short, mixed grass, prairie, haylands, or pastures. But what's key for this species is it needs that expansive habitat. So usually greater than 150 hectares in size. So this is a species that's particularly impacted by those linear disturbances, such as roads, um, fences, um, lines of trees, transmission corridors, et cetera. So our last uh, or second to last endemic is the Ferunganus hawk, um, obviously bigger than the other species we've talked about so far with it being a raptor. Um, they have a large heavy bill. Um, they also have dark feathering on the legs that forms a V shape in flight. So they are one of the few hawks that have feathers going all the way down to the toes. Um, and the dark feathers on the legs contrast really nicely with the uh, white chest and belly. Um, so when they're flying, the way their legs are tucked up, it forms sort of a dark brown V. Um, they nest in isolated trees naturally. Um, there's also been um, conservation efforts to put up um, artificial nesting poles um, as this species um, took a big dip about 50 or so years ago, um, although now they've recovered a little bit um, as we have some breeding prayers back in the province. Um, they prefer expansive uh, grasslands and their main prey source is ground squirrels. So if you find a ground squirrel colony um, in your birding, it's worth, uh, worth it to take a second and look around and see if there are Ferminus hawks around. So also the beloved burrowing owl. Um, they are small for an owl. Um, they have a white throat, which this guy's got his head a little bit uh, tucked down, so you can't see that so well. Um, also has white eyebrows, in quotation marks, over um, the their eyes. Um, and they have broad barring on the breast and belly. They also have fairly long legs um, as they're very proficient um, for moving about the ground. And they are found in open short grassed prairie areas, um, in areas where there's also abandoned burrows of other animals as the burrowing owl does not um, dig its own burrow. So those were our endemic species. So next we're moving on to other prairie grassland species um, that kind of secondarily use the, the prairie. So they are birds that spend a portion of their life cycle in the grasslands, or they might have only um, a smaller portion of their uh, breeding range within the grasslands, unlike those endemics who really um, might only breed in the grasslands or use the grasslands for their entire yearly um, cycle. So the first of which is the song sparrow. This is a pretty ubiquitous sparrow that you see in um, a lot of different habitats in Manitoba. They have broad coarse streaks on their breast that converge into a central spot. Um, when you look at the head, they have a brown and gray crown or top to their head, and they have a reddish brown tail and wings. Another sparrow um, that we find in a couple of different habitats across Manitoba, including the grasslands, is the clay-colored sparrow. Uh, smaller than the song sparrow, uh, overall a buffy color. Um, they have a dark brown crown and very uniquely a gray nape, which I think is probably where the clay-colored sparrow gets its name. Um, it also has a strong dark mustache um, of feathers in what we call the, the mallards, which is the region that extends down from the, from the beak, and also has a brown ear patch that you can see just behind the eye um, over here. So another sparrow here, about the same size as a song sparrow, is the savanna sparrow. Um, this 
sparrow is, you can find it in different places, but um, more strongly associated with the grassland than some of the other sparrows we've talked about. Um, it has a boldly streaked back with finer streaks on the breast, um, going into a white belly near the legs. Uh, they have a strong and complete eye line going from the rear of their eye back towards the nape of the neck. Um, and they also have a bit of that mustache coming down, um, downwards from the bill or from the beak, sorry. They also usually have yellow lures, which is the area um, of feathers between the uh, beak and the eye. And you can see it um, right in this area here. Next, we have the grasshopper sparrow. Um, once again, a little bit smaller uh, than the song sparrow. Uh, a buffy brown color overall. And the back is patterned with a mix of rufous or reddish color, black and gray. And you can just see a bit of that patterning here um, that contrasts with the overall buffiness of the rest of the sparrow. They also have a complete white eye ring and a fairly large bill um, for, fair, for sparrow species. And the grasshopper sparrow is another good one um, to uh, take a listen and if you hear the call um, or the song, then look a little closer. So next we have the lark sparrow, which as long as you can see the face, you're unlikely to get mixed up um, with anyone else. It's uh, bigger than the sparrows we've talked about so far. They have a bold harlequin or contrasting face pattern. You can see the patterning of the rufous color and then the white and then a black stripe through the eye um, with rufous once again in um, sort of behind the eye, white and black. Um, if the head, if you can't see the head or the head is not enough for you, um, it also has a dark spot on a clean whitish breast. So unlike the song sparrow that has the stripes converging in the spot, the lark sparrow just has the one spot. Um, it also has white sides and tip of the tail that you can see while in flight, um, but can't see so well when they are perched. Next, we have the Vesper sparrow, which is also a larger sparrow. They have a streaked breast with an off-white belly. They also have a complete white eye ring. And they have um, a pale malar area with wraps around behind the street, the cheek, sorry. So you can, I'll just let me get my mouse here. Um, you can see the malar area coming out from by the um, beak and wrapping around um, down across the cheek area towards the nape of the neck. So moving out of sparrows, we have the bobo link next. Um, and this is actually a species uh, that uses the grasslands, but um, unlike a lot of the species we're talking about today, they also use, in addition to the mixed grass prairie, they also use the tall grass prairie. Um, so they're a larger bird. The male is very distinct with his black underside. Um, it's got a creamy nape, the back of the neck, um, and the back and wings um, are black and white. The female is another one of those sparrow looking birds. Um, they have a plain nape, which is the area between the beak and the eyes. And they also have a large pinkish bill. So, bill. Um, if you can get a good look at it, distinguishes it from a sparrow, as sparrows uh, don't have quite that thick bill that the bobolins do. Um, so moving on to the loggerhead shrike. So there are two species of loggerhead, or two species of shrike in Manitoba. We have the northern shrike and the loggerhead shrike, and they look quite similar. Um, they both have the gray head and back the black mask stripe by their eyes, um, a hooked bill, and um, black uh, wings and tail with a white um, underbelly and chest. Um, to tell the difference between the loggerhead shrike and the northern shrike, the loggerhead shrike has a broader dark mask, 
a stubbier bill with the hook being less defined and is darker gray on the back. And the shrikes are an interesting bird. Um, they're also known sometimes as the butcher bird as they um, will eat uh, other small birds, uh, small mammals um, and larger insects. And they can use the thorns on um, vegetation like hawthorn tree, uh, trees, uh, barbed wire on fences or sturdy twigs um, to impale their prey and keep it immobile um, while they are while they're eating or to store it. So next we have the horned lark. Um, this is always a, a nice springtime bird for me to see as they sometimes come back quite early in the year. Um, they have a black mustache, sort of black in that mallard region. Um, they also have a distinct black triangle in, their, uh, in the neck area. Their body is a pale rusty or sandy brown. And when they're flying, you can see their dark tail, which has pale feathers in the middle, and also a narrow white edge. And you can often find them in areas of bare ground, as that's their nesting habitats. So I've seen them, for example, on the sides of roads. Next, we have the Eastern Bluebird. Um, once again, not, um, not exclusively a grassland species, but we do see them out in the grassland. Um, they have a very distinct coloration with their orange breast that extends up into the sides of their neck um, with a white belly with um, entirely blue above, including the top of the head, the back, the wings, and the tail. And the females have a similar color pattern, but overall um, look drabber in color. And uh, Eastern bluebirds and the mountain bluebirds I'm going to talk about next both benefit from nest boxes that can be seen along fence posts in some agriculture areas um, that are sometimes put up by landowners uh, or sometimes um, an agreement between a landowner and a conservation organization. So it's also possible to see mountain bluebirds. Um, the male is overall a pale blue color. Uh, the female is grayish overall um, and tends towards more blue on the tail and wings. Um, both male and female have long wings and tail. And like I said, they're also another nest box um, using species. So next we have the Western Kingbird. And the Western Kingbird has a pale gray head and a dark back and wings with a buffy yellow um, sort of chest, although that, that um, gray can sort of fade into the yellow on the chest and belly. Um, they have a black tail with white edges. And next we have the Eastern Kingbird, about the same size as the Western Kingbird. Um, the head is the darkest gray color, but it also has a gray back with a white throat, breast, and belly. And it has a black tail with a white tip that can be seen in flight and also handily seen at rest, which is usually not the case when there's white on the tail with bird species, as you can probably tell from what we've gone through so far in this presentation. Um, when I started birding, I, I knew what species the Eastern Kingbird was, and I knew what species the Western Kingbird was, but I got their names mixed up for some reason. It just wouldn't stick in my head. So I thought I'd offer um, a quick way to, to uh, remind which species is, it has which name um, that I use, which is the Eastern Kingbird is foggy or gray like the Maritimes. I have family out there, so I've experienced this firsthand. Um, while the Western Kingbird um, has the golden colored um, breast and belly, which is gold like Western wheat. So next we have the Eastern Meadow Lark with a yellow neck and breast. Um, with a black necklace. And when in flight, you can see the tail has white outer feathers. And they've, they're often seen um, 
sitting on fences or along roadsides, uh, belting out their beautiful song. And uh, just between the song and the way they look, they're quite a unique bird. So next we have the American goldfinch. Once again, another very unique looking bird. Um, the male does not need a lot of explanation with the bright yellow on um, part of the head and also on the undersides with a little black crown right on the top of the head extending to the beak and the black and white wings and tail. Um, the female immature birds and non-breeding birds um, are much less of that bright lemon yellow. You can see them down in the left hand corner. Um, however, you can still see the two wing bars. Um, and both um, will have the whitish undertail um, and also underwing coverts. So the feathers underneath the wing and also underneath the tail. So next we have the upland sandpiper. Um, this bird's proportions, body proportions, um, always seem a little bit funny to me with um, the small head with the really big eye and then the larger body. Um, they are a fairly sizable shorebird. Um, like I said, a small head with that large black eye. They have a short yellowish bill, um, also long legs and, and a long tail. Um, you can see them in sort of uh, wetter areas in the grasslands where they might be foraging or like this bird in the picture often up on fence posts um, surveying the area. Moving on to birds of prey we have a short-eared owl. Um, the short-eared owl is almost double the size of the burrowing owl. Overall it's a very pale sort of buffy color um, with a strongly streaked underside. They have large, or sorry, dark triangles around the eye, which to me gives them a bit of a sunken eye appearance. And the undersides of the wings have bold dark bars on the edges of the primaries, which are the main flight feathers on the outside of the wing. And the upper side of the wing has a uh, buffy patch on the primaries, so on the outside of the wing. Next, we have the Swainson's hawk. Swainson's hawk has um, a paler throat area, but a dark breast, um, which is quite unique. They also have pale coverts um, underneath the wings. You can see this bird is, we're looking up at it, and the coverts are this, that white area on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, the wings themselves are very long and pointed. And then the other wing pattern um, you can see is that it is a dark brown on the trailing edge of the wing. So as hawks are often over top of you, um, these are some good identifying characteristics. Next, we've got the red-tailed hawk, which is seen in a lot of different um, habitats. So for identification, of course, you've got that red tail but there are lots of different degrees of, of colors for these red-tailed hawks. So if the tail is not looking so red to you, um, you can look for the dark mark on the leading edge of the wings. You can hear, see it here extending from the head sort of to that joint. And you're also looking at a pale breast with a dark head um, as opposed to the Swainson's hawk, which had the, a dark breast. So the, dark brown color is in a different area for the red-tailed hawk versus the Swainson's hawk. Next, we have the Northern Harrier um, that you might also know as the Marsh Hawk. Uh, they are a different color depending on male or female with the female being brown and the male being gray. Both male and female have a white rump that is visible in flight. And both male and female have black wing tips and black edges of the wings, um, but are otherwise pretty pale on the underside. So 
So then we've got the sharp-tailed grouse. Um, some people might know this bird as a prairie chicken. Um, Manitoba did have a species of prairie chickens, but um, no longer do. Um, so the, the name and use for the sharp-tailed grouse is, is the sharp-tailed grouse. Um, it's quite a heavy bird. It's often on the ground as opposed to flying, although they can fly. Um, you can see in this picture, they have a spotted pattern on the wing. Um, and you can just sort of see it peeking out here, but on the breast, they have a chevron pattern or a series of uh, looks like almost arrows or triangles. Um, they also have a pale pointed tail that you can see here, um, but it's very distinct in flight. And these birds are very um, cryptically patterned. Um, so if they are off um, in habitat, you often um, might not see them until they move. So those were prairie grassland species. I'm gonna to touch on just a few as some examples for prairie wetland species. Um, in areas where grassland floods, particularly in the spring, it can be a um, uh, really good uh, habitat, especially for stopover on migration for some of these species, as well as if um, the water stays around, uh, it can be good breeding habitat as well. So one of those is the Franklin skulls. They are uh, have a black hood with noticeable white marks around the eyes. You can see that here. Um, so this is a Franklin skull in breeding plumage. When they're in their non-breeding plumage, they still have a partial black hood and they still have white markings around the eyes. They also, you can't see here because we're looking at the underside of the Franklin skulls, but they also have large white spots on their wingtips, which stays in the non-breeding plumage. And in their breeding plumage, they have an orange bill, while in non-breeding plumage, it turns black. Next, we have the killdeer, which is found in a lot of different wetland habitats. It's got the double breast band, the two, bland, two bands of black. It has an orange eye ring, a long tail, and a rufous or reddish rump. And conveniently, it says its name, Kildee or Kildeer. Then we've got the marbled godwit with a long upturned bill with a pinkish base, black legs. Um, it's got a cinnamon colored underwing, which you can only see when in flight, and overall a buffy cinnamon color. Another example of a um, species that can use sort of grassland wetland areas is the Wilson's phalarope. Um, in this case, the female is the more colorful bird. Um, they have a slender bill and generally they're, they're smaller than I always picture when I think of phalaropes. Um, they have a black stripe running down from head to the neck into the back with rufous markings along the neck and back and have a white rump in flight. So an interesting thing about phalaropes is that they can spin in circles to create a water vortex when feeding, um, which then draws the invertebrates they're looking for up near the surface of the water. So just a quick little section on where to see grassland birds in Manitoba. Um, as I said, most of the areas to see these grassland birds in the mixed grass prairies are in the very Southwest of Manitoba. Um, so there is a publication called the Manitoba Grasslands Birding Trail, and you can find it online. And uh, you used to be able to get it in person at the Travel Manitoba office at the Forks. I don't know if they're open right now, um, but it's a short booklet and it gives you some um, ideas of sites that you may want to visit or routes that you may want to take. We also have the Southwestern Mixed Grass Prairie IBA, and the routes from the Manitoba Grasslands Birding Trail are actually in um, within the Southwest Mixed Grass Prairie IBA. Um, so the, uh, the, the land in this IBA is mostly private land. Um, however, you can go along the mile roads and, um, and do some good birding with uh, some well-placed stops to listen and look. And then our other space to see grassland birds is in the newest IBA, uh, the Spy Hill Ellis Archie IBA. 
And once again, this is um, land that is majority used for um, cattle farming, et cetera. So there can be access to land in this IBA um, as long as you contact, um, you can either contact us here at Manitoba IBA, we can get you in contact, um, or you can call NCC, they also have a site there, um, and we can work on getting you access. So that's it for our presentation here. So any other questions for um, myself or Rebecca, um, we'd be happy to answer. Just let me get out of my screen sharing here so I can see the comments. And yeah, you're welcome to type in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask a question um, if you would like. Oh yes, sorry, I'm seeing um, the metal arc stuff here. Yes, that was a that was a mistype. Uh, I see Tom asking where the Spy Hill area is. Um, it's in uh, um, western Manitoba, on the border of uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So it's partly in uh, Manitoba, partly in Saskatchewan, and up sort of same similar latitude to Riding Mountain, just further west. So Riley's asking, are there any intact prairies north of the Duck Mountains? Um, not as far as I know, but I can certainly look into that more. Um, I don't know, does Rebecca, do you know anything more about um, intact prairies north of the Duck Mountains? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not really familiar with that area a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It is getting a bit, yeah, a bit far into more of the, the boreal ecozone. Um, there might be perhaps what's considered a grassland, whether they're prairies. <laughs> um, that's actually an, an excellent question. I'd have to also uh, look into that to see if, if there is still um, prairie communities up that way. Well, it looks like we are um, about out of time here. So I'll just thank everyone for coming and spending time with us today. Um, this webinar, as I said, was recorded and uh, will be up on the Manitoba IBA YouTube page um, in the next few days, just depending on how long it takes me to, uh, to download and, and buffer the presentation. So yeah, a big thank you to Rebecca for joining us today for this webinar and uh, for all of you. And I hope you uh, learned some uh, or refreshed your knowledge of grassland birds. And so thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.